and welcome back to Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. We're broadcasting here from the Think Tech Studios in Pioneer Plaza in Honolulu. Likeable Science is all about making science fun and accessible and helping people realize that science is not something to be shoved out, shoved off into a corner and thought about as a very isolated, uh, separate thing, but it's a vital and interesting part of everyone's life. And to help me explore that today, I have with me here in the studio Susan Scott, who is a uh, marine biologist, an author, uh, sailor, adventurer, uh, and has melded her science with, with all these other uh, interesting parts of her life. Welcome, Susan. Thank you. Uh, Susan uh, last year published a book, Call Me Captain, in which she details really richly a, a voyage she took to uh, Palmyra Atoll from Honolulu here, a 2,000 mile trip, 1,500 mile trip. 1,000. 1,000 mile trip, okay. And, uh, but at the same time, it's a, it's a very rich book with uh, tons of interesting biology interwoven into it, uh, seabirds, uh, sea life, all kinds of things. Very interesting sort of memoir of, of her life and the transition she was going through. So, um, but, but you said biology has been a big help to you in, in, in sort of in putting this book together. Maybe you start, well, you can start there. Well, it's interesting that biology is important to me because I didn't grow up in a family that uh, went outside and did much outdoors mm -hmm. with na in nature or noticed wildlife much. And so when I was a little girl, there was uh, two sisters who lived next door to us. And in those days, they call them the old maid sisters. They were two retired school teachers called the Imer sisters. I remember them vividly because they let me come over and look at their National Geographic uh -huh. magazines. Okay. And they had stacks of them. And the amazing thing that I remember, and, and it always reminds me that to pay attention when children ask you questions because I would ask them about the Moai and Easter Island and, and all, all the things that we saw in National Geographic, mm -hmm. the wildlife, and they would say to me, and I remember them saying, and I remember their tones of voice, they said, you can go there. Excellent. I said, no, not really. <laughs> yes, you can go there. And, and I believed them right. for, for whatever reason. And, and I think I that think. is the value of telling children things that you never know what's going to really stick. But I really believed that I could do it and I could go there and if I saw uh, wildlife or animal on TV that I really thought was cool, I thought, I, I can go there and see it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I grew up and did it. So I've been, been traveling well, pretty excellent. much most of my life. Yes, and, and you have that, that I can do it attitude comes through very clearly in this book when you, as a relative novice right. sailor, only right. sailing for a few years, then decide to make this <laughs> extended journey and wisely practiced around the islands here, but, but learned everything you needed to know about, about your boat and what, how to do it, how to navigate, uh, and uh, then, then took off. Well, it was harder than I thought it was going to be. Right. I, I'm not sure I would do it again knowing what I know now, <laughs> but uh, I, I, I thought I knew more than I did. And it, it's much easier to sit on the, or be in the cockpit with someone who, who's really good and is telling you to do things. That's a, a completely different than doing it yourself and making those decisions. Right. No, you, you talk about it in yeah. this book in different places, ways sort of small and large, where as captain you're, you're called upon to make those decisions. Right. You have to just do it, and, right. and people more or less have to yeah. go, go with the flow. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so so it, it's, it's, uh, it's stunning. But uh, so, you, you, so how, how did you then specifically get involved in marine biology? What was it that sort of drew you into that? that well, I, uh, I met my husband in Denver. We, I was a nurse there, and he okay. was a, a re, an intern mm -hmm. uh, doing his medical residency. And his dream was to live in Hawaii, and I had never been here. I thought, oh. okay, whatever. I, that seems mm -hmm. fine to me. I didn't really understand anything about Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And so we moved here together, and uh, I was afraid of the ocean. I, I just, I thought I would go back to school and study wildlife management from the Rocky Mountain point of view, because mm -hmm. that's where I was living and that's what I liked. But we got here and I thought, I don't even know what tides are, how they work. I don't know uh, when, I, I, it's embarrassing almost to say it, but people would say the surf is up and I thought, really, up, up where? What does that mean <laughs> that it's up? And so uh, I was afraid of the ocean and I was afraid to get in it. and. I was also afraid of the unknown. So Craig said, what, do you, what specifically are you afraid of? Because he had grown up in the ocean. 
And I said, I, I don't know. That's the problem. I think it's, it's scarier because I don't know what mm -hmm. I'm worried about. So I took a course at the University of Hawaii that changed my life. It was ichthyology course, a study of fish, and uh, I just everything I learned, I just was dumbfounded. I just thought that was so amazing. And the students at UH who were um, my my classmates who grew up here thought that I was cra crazy person. It's like this woman likes she she likes sea urchins. She thinks sea cucumbers are interesting because they grew up with them, so right, it wasn't yeah. new. So uh, I never lost that. I, I still feel like every time I get in the ocean, which is often, uh, I, I, I'm expecting to see something wonderful, and I usually do. Yeah, it, it is. It's, it's, we're so so lucky to have such a, a nice, rich ocean and with such yeah. a diverse life around. I right. mean, you, guys, mm -hmm. you go in the, the fish of all different sizes, shapes, yeah. colors, exactly. doing all the different kinds of little strange games that fish play. Right. Uh, right. The, the, Beautiful sea turtles, uh, you know. That's right. Um, so even if you if you know what it is, just watching them, following them, mm -hmm. do something is, is an amazing experience. I saw a, a seahorse last year, and I thought that I I was so excited. I, I was snorkeling and getting water in my <laughs> snorkel because I was so excited, mm -hmm. and I got some pictures. And so the next day I went out, and and he was still there. And I say he because. The males have a small range of about a square meter. Mm -hmm. They don't move much. They're the ones that carry the babies. Right. And so I'm snorkeling around and I, uh, away from him, and I see this other seahorse going, going, going. I thought, the seahorse is actually going somewhere. You know, she, she would get a little waylaid by some, a rock or seaweed and go, and then keep going. And it was his mate uh -huh. who was coming back in the m morning. They had this uh, reuniting little ritual dance. And then she goes off again for the day. So I got to see her actually follow her to him, and they, they hooked their tails, oh. did a little dance. I, really, I was almost crying. I thought it was so exciting. And uh, I think you just have to get in the water and just see what happens. Exactly. And so a lot of people say, oh, I never see anything on that reef. Well, I, I've never been on that reef that I haven't <laughs> seen something. And it isn't, doesn't look like a big, fancy, colorful coral reef. It's a, a, my favorite place on the North Shore. Mm -hmm. And that's probably why it's so good. There's not a lot of people there, and people think, oh, there's not much here, but I have to watch. No, the, the, the life, wherever you're looking for it, yeah. is, is, is so intriguing yeah. in, in all of its various uh, various right. uh, permutations. And so you, you uh, studied some uh, marine biology, and but as I understand from the book, you, you ran into almost some uh, sort of resistance uh, to your trying to make this to, sh to share it with broader audiences. Right. Uh. Yeah, I actually thought uh, there was a lack of information in the local newspaper about marine life here. Mm -hmm. And so I made a proposal to write a column called Ocean Watch, mm -hmm. which I've been doing now for 28 years. Mm -hmm. But uh, I didn't get in right away, and I was still in school, and, and I had friends and who had spouses and girlfriends and boyfriends who were working on their doctorates. and they. We're not, a couple of them were really, really vocal about how I should not be able to write about their research because I would water it down by, by using uh, newspaper terminology, you know, level of reading, that it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be right. And I thought, no, you just say it in a, in a normal way. It'll be, it'll be accurate. Right. I mean, you just take out some of the qualifiers, and, you know, because people don't. I want to read the scientific papers, but they are, they're interested in what other and what researchers are doing, and so uh, yeah, I did get some resistance, and it settled down after a while. But uh, there's still people, you know, always who, especially sure. with that email now, who like to tell me <laughs> what they think, which is fine. But it, it's no, I, I think I think it's a, a valuable thing, and obviously because that's what I try to do here mm -hmm. is to, to share science more broadly. And right. I think it's got to be. I think if we expect the public to support science. They have to understand what's going on, and, and it, it's a, because so much science was uh, taught by scientists to, to people who become scientists. Right. There is almost this uh, is an unfortunate gap and a, yeah. a, a lack of that broad understanding, right. and we have to have to keep trying to, to uh, help help people really understand why why they should care about science and all. That. And, and the the rewarding thing for me about the column is I get emails from people who say, I, 
I've never been in the ocean. I don't know anything about it. These are people in Hawaii. But I love reading about the, the stories that you tell and, and, and the experiences you have. So I think, well, I, I am sharing that in a, in a good way. And the other thing that I like about the column is there's so much bad news. There's so much bad news in the media about the marine world that people have given up. Mm -hmm. A lot of people who don't go out there just mm -hmm. think it's a big oil slick with you know all this trash mm -hmm. plastic. Someone said to me, how, how much plastic do you have to plow through <laughs> to, to sail in, uh -huh. in the Pacific Ocean? I said, well, I, ne I never seen it. I have never seen any offshore. Uh -huh. I mean, it's, you know, the, the Pacific's, I don't know, 63 million square <laughs> miles. And yeah, it, it collects in the harbors and places right. that we see it. But they, I think the picture is, is so negative that people give up mm -hmm. and think, well, you know, the global warming and the acidification and all the things that are happening, coral reefs dying, that they think it's already gone, but there's so much left. Right, so right. And, and you, you paint very beautiful left. pictures in your column of these. You almost, there's little snapshots of a, an interesting animal or an interesting interaction that's, yeah. that's happening. And that's, yeah. Well, that, I like people to know there's so much left. Yeah, yeah that's, so no, that's, that's, that's really, really critical. Uh -huh. And at the same time, you, you, you have obviously learned a great deal about boats, too. I mean, it's, it's well, very, very clear from this that you, you became quite, quite the expert on... Uh, well, I wouldn't <laughs> say expert, but uh, the, the boat for some people is the reason to do it. Mm -hmm. But the boat for me is a way to get to my marine animals. Uh -huh. So the boat isn't as interesting to uh -huh. me, but it's something I have to know to so, keep my stay alive. Right, in a sense, it's, it's <laughs> like a microscope. Well, it's a tool that you've got to learn to tool, use well exactly. and maintain well. It, and, exactly. Yeah. And to me, it's a tool. And you know, a lot of people are all shining up their boat right. and fixing other things. <laughs> you just wanted to sail well. I, huh? I needed to sail well, and I needed to stay in good shape. Right. And yeah. so that that's partly Excellent. polishing it up. But mostly, uh, it's I see it as a tool, and, mm -hmm. and it's a great tool, really. And then there's a third aspect of the book is sort of the, your whole memoir-esque strand about you're talking about this whole transition and rethinking about your relationship with right. my husband and you know how, how that was all working right. and, the, and the, the beautiful transition you you capture so well from going from this very doubt-filled early stage to this very sort of serene calm very positive end stage uh, and it's it's uh, I think you captured that uh, well, st you. stunningly thank well so thank you I, I think the um, when I was feeling the worst I, I remember lying in bed thinking, I just want to wake up in a place where I feel really good every day, and the days are just wonderful, because I, I, I have had a really nice life. Mm -hmm. And Turn Island was that for me, and I had been there before, and, and so going there and just being surrounded by wildlife, having booby birds sit on your head, and pl you know, playing with fairy turn chicks, you know, we were putting bands on their legs and talking to them, and we had sea turtles uh, hatching, so there were little hatchlings running around. It was just, it's just like Dr. Doolittle <laughs> Island. And so, so I thought that this is what I need to do. I need to get, I think we're all part of nature, but we're so removed from it when we live in the cities and the way we live today that um, just kind of forget that it's a, it's a healing source. It's a source of peace. Exactly, and and it's that, that's a very a very good point you make. Is more and more of our populations are being uh, centered in urban areas and having less and less contact with right. the natural world. Therefore, they are losing touch with it, and that is a worrisome trend because people will not value and protect things that they don't understand. Yeah. And, and therefore, exactly. uh, you know, it's, uh, I, again, I think I think your your column, your uh, talking, your, uh, your your book all, all do a wonderful job of helping to to promote that. We're going to dig a little more deeply into this when we come back, but right now we're going to take a short break here. Uh, I'm here in the Think Tech studios with Susan Scott. I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science. We're talking about uh, biology, boats, and autobiography. <laughs> we'll be right back. Hi, aloha. My name is Chris Leatham, and I have host a show called The Economy and You. Uh, the show plays every Wednesday at noon, and. On my show, I bring on guests who are interested or are working in the technology space. And uh, so I'd like you to come and watch the show and learn with me about all the sort of exciting things that we're doing in Hawaii to build and grow our economy ecosystem. 
So I'd like to say aloha, and I look forward to seeing you on the show. Thank you. biology story. Right, yeah. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. That's Ted Ralston. You know, Ted is the uh, host of uh, Where the Road Leads. It shows uh, every Friday from 4 to 5 p.m. It's about technology. It's about how people are collaborating and solve problems with modern technology. It's where the road leads. We all know that. We should all be listening. Join us there, 4 to 5 p.m. every Friday. Now, what about that do you agree with? All of it. I knew he'd say that. Aloha. Say aloha. Okay. Aloha. Good. And you're back on Likeable Science here in Think, on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. With me today is author, adventurer, biologist, Susan Scott. Uh, we're talking about her book, Call Me Captain, and about her uh, adventures that she describes in this book and about, about the science she's done. And we t talked earlier a little bit about, in general, about some of these aspects, but I, I want to focus in a little bit now on, on the work that you described here. You made a great deal of effort, went to a great deal of effort to get down to Palmyra Atoll, where uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, I guess, and some other groups, maybe Nature Conservancy, were all involved in sets of studies trying to preserve those these tiny little islands uh, from invasive species and trying to figure out why changes were happening. So maybe tell us a little bit about some of the uh, studies you were doing there. Well, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, Service was uh, starting a pilot study to see uh, what to do with these native Pisonia trees that were falling down. And so there were several uh, theories of why they were falling down. And one was that they, there was a parasite called scale. It's like mealybug, the little aphids kind of thing but it's white, little white, they look like grains of rice. Mm -hmm. And that the um, ants, which are alien species there, were farming the scale. So they were, because they liked, it's a great biology story, they liked to eat the, um, the uh, honeydew, it's called honeydew, but it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a substance that the, that the scale extrudes. Right. And so the ants l love that, it's sweet. And so that by farming them, they have a food source. Right, they'll so protect they, them. And yeah, so they were carrying them nicely up the trees. That's, that was the theory. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, scale was taking the nutrients from the, the trees. Right. And then these enormous trees that were a, a, as big around as a compact car just mm -hmm. crashing down. And so uh, I didn't realize the, how terrible that was until I was there and, and just see these enormous trees that really look pretty healthy just falling down and you could hear them in the background. And so what the, uh, it was a pilot study because what they wanted to know was there, there were two species of ants that farm scale. If you put out a certain kind of ant poison, how long would it take? There, there was a dominant species called big-headed ants. Mm -hmm. If you killed them in an area, how long would it take for the other species that farm, called crazy ants, to move in. And in that interval in between would be a time that you could introduce ladybugs to the atoll to eat the scale. Mm -hmm. But if their ants are still farming, there's no way that right. the ladybugs, ladybugs could keep survive. up. Right. That they couldn't keep right. up because this farming is quite efficient. And right. I, I fell in love with ants. Ants are, ants mm -hmm. are just astonishing. And so they, um, so what we did is, you know, put out little peanut butter and caro syrup squares on little white index cards I cut and put them around and then count the ants before the poisoning and after poisoning in, in different areas of the atoll. I had four right. uh, plots, one control cool. and three and three experimental plots. And the big problem, so, so the ants are alien and the scale is alien and the Pisonia are native and they weren't doing, the theory was they weren't doing well together. But the problem was, and people sort of anticipated this, that the hermit crabs, which are like fist-sized, really beautiful, re bright red crabs in these turban shells, would really love the peanut butter and caro syrup, which they did. So they were like, oh, great food. So they would just come rushing over. I had, I had 20 uh, papers in each of the four plots. I'd go from one to the other. But I'd turn around, and there would be crabs all eating. Mm -hmm. And so... So that was a problem. And the other problem there was the rats. And the rats had been introduced probably uh, during World War II, may maybe mm -hmm. before, but during the World War II, they really uh, started proliferating. And there was an estimated 30,000 rats in a pretty small mm -hmm. area. 
and you know you got a rat problem when you uh, see rats peeking out at you <laughs> from, from behind right. trees and rocks. And so they were, they were you know, we're biologists because we love animals, right. and I just thought they were really bold and brilliant, and they'd look around and, and almost saying, you can't catch me. And you know, there's really, there was right. no way we could. Right. And so I would turn my back, and they would get the, also be on the peanut butter yeah. and carol syrup. And then one rat, uh, one day, would actually got into the, the tray that I set it up in. And, and then a few days later, that same rat, I think, actually got into the peanut butter jar. So it's like, well, why wait for her to put them out? I'll just go get them out of the jar. That being entrepreneurial. Yeah, you know? and so uh, my friend Alex and I were, were watching this uh, in the jar and just laughing because, you know, it was really, they're brilliant. Right. And so we um, noticed that it had cataracts. It was an old rat or um, might have gotten into some of the ant poison that we put out. But we felt really sorry for them, for him. So we gave him a little dish with the little peanut butter because it was blind right. and bumping into things. And so uh, we, Alex always said, don't tell anybody I'm, I'm feeding rats because he was doing his PhD uh, research on the alien species of the palmyrectal. Right. And so um, the next day we found the, the crab dead and the, I mean the rat dead and the crabs had, had eaten most of it. Mm -hmm. We could see that there was still fur. And so uh, we finally found some cages, rat, uh, live rat trap cages. Mm -hmm. And so the ants could get in that because it's wire, right. but the crabs and the rats could not get in. Right. And interestingly, the crab, the rats had never seen these cages. They didn't come anywhere near them. Right. And so we, we, they'd never, those cages hadn't been used in mm -hmm. that generation of rats or even before that. So we don't know how they knew that. They mm -hmm. just knew. And uh, I don't know if it smelled bad or something about those cages, the rats, I don't know. <laughs> we never saw a rat anywhere near the cage. Uh -huh. And the crabs would get on the outside of it, but they couldn't get in. Right. So that finally worked pretty well. Right. So we did the, uh, that took a month, two months, mm -hmm. a long time to right. get all these. And I had to kayak out to all these different sites right. every day. But uh, we finally got the study going and um, found out there was probably, I think it was a 10-day to two-week period where the big-headed ants were dead from the poison in, in the area, and the crazy ants started to move in, I think 10 days to two weeks. Right. So that was the window to introduce right. ladybugs, which was okay. also a big controversy among the researchers sure. because introducing alien species is right. uh, just it's so danger. fraught with yeah. danger right. and so many bad stories in the past. Sure. And in, and in the meantime, after uh, I was finished with this pilot study, the Pisonia tree stopped falling down. <laughs> and no, no one knew why. They stopped falling down before the rats were eradicated. And so there were other theories then of what had been happening. Did they get something in the groundwater? Then no one ever knew. But they're everywhere now on the atoll. I haven't been back, but my friend Alex has done a rat eradication. He finished his, his research and got his PhD and works for a great organization called Island Conservation. Mm -hmm. And they do eradication of alien species on, uh, in wildlife areas. Mm -hmm. And so they killed all 30,000 rats uh, by dropping poison from the helicopters and, and throwing it and you know, really a lot of poison. And a lot of people have asked me and, and him and his organization why, how that poison could be safe. But it only works on mammals. Right. And rats are the only well, mammals. Because yeah, right. yeah. uh, the invertebrates have different clotting. Right, exactly. It's, it's, the, it, it's, it's the whole issue of targeting your poisons very properly. Right, and it, this was targeted at an uh, anticoagulant. Right, right. Poison. Presumably not in doses high enough to bother people or not, right. not, not no. around people, no, right? No, yeah. No. So they, they killed, the, they killed the, the rats, and then the, uh, tw I think 24 to 48 hours later, I wasn't there, but Alex said all the rat carcasses were gone. The crabs, which we estimated about a hundred thousand uh, hermit crabs, <laughs> just ate them all but the teeth. There were little piles of teeth. He said that, that's all they found of the rats. So it must have eaten fur and all. So crabs are fabulous recyclers. Oh yeah. Oh, and uh, we felt we felt like the, uh, the rats really needed to go. Yeah. It wasn't their fault they were there, but they did need to go, and the atoll has really come back. Mm -hmm. he, he's there right now. I think he just got back yesterday. Oh. So he keeps me in touch with me of, of what's happening in Palmyra. Yeah, because uh, 
the ecologists now find in these in any ecosystem that species removing one species even if it's been introduced but it's been right. there for a while right. will have these very odd effects that can right. bounce on for years yeah and the, the rats were it turns out were eating a lot of the seedlings of the native trees mm -hmm. and so without them the place has just come come back uh, the, the plant life has really come back the native plant life so I think the Nature Conservancy co-manages the atoll and uh, with the Fish and Wildlife Service and they've done some great things there and they're they're now uh, talking about taking out the palm trees the uh -huh. coconut palms which are not native to the atoll uh -huh. but there was a copra farm there once so, uh, okay. so the, that should help at least the, the coconut palms won't, won't run away from you, you know? that's right that's right yeah. <laughs> but no removing removing yeah. and targeting species is a very tricky yeah. business I know in Guam now they're trying to get rid of the brown tree snakes right and they're using and uh, Tylenol dead, dead, dead Tylenol dead, laced dead mice, dead mice because right. the snakes are one of the few snakes will eat dead prey and are extremely sensitive to acetaminophen right yeah. and so basically then that that food source won't either attract or be harmful uh -huh. to anything else I guess that, that right. thing. so I know I'll be like, interested to see how that works yeah uh, yeah well everybody will because there's such a problem in Guam, there's no birds left. Right. Apparently. Yeah, yeah they've, they've really decimated the populations, and of course, occasionally you read about them showing up here. And so you have to think, though, what other species might be harmed by dead mice right. full of acetaminophen, right? Right. right. <laughs> but they, I guess they, 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 they drop them from the air on. Car, glued to cards with loops of string on them so that they hang in the trees. Oh, so they, they don't actually get on the ground, apparently, oh, but they I thought see. they might do some harm. And they, uh, they mostly are, and the, and the, and the, the tree snakes. And the tree snakes, they can go around in the trees, yeah. So again, it, it struck me as a it's sort of similar, in, in a sense, very, very targeted, you know. And they're native to Australia? I think so, yes, right. And they're, of course, they're, they're in their own ecosystem right. and they're kept in control, but uh, right. yeah. So it's. Uh, well, the, the, I was a volunteer for the Fish and Wildlife Service in this study, and the, uh, it was really interesting to see how careful they were with mm -hmm. this. This was a pilot just to see. No one had really decided right. to do the ladybugs, but before they could even talk about it, was it possible? Right. And so I, I thought it was really interesting, and I loved writing about it, about what a control plot is, right. yeah, okay. why you have to have that right. to compare to something else. And, and uh, when I was editing this book, there were people who said, well, there's a little too much biology in here. And <laughs> no, I thought, no, nah. no, 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 I, I need it. Right. I, it I, need, I need to, it was part of my life. It was part of what, what got me back on track. And I, and I wanted to share that with people of how wonderful it it's, all is. Interesting. It's intriguing, too, the, the ladybug issue, because while well, they were so careful there in the U.S., of course, in the mainland U.S., they've been conducting sort of a large-scale, uncontrolled experiment with ladybugs by introducing one species of ladybugs commercially available, shipping them around to anyone who wants to buy oh, ladybugs right. to protect their gardens, and oh. that species of ladybug is now dominating and wiping out oh, dozens and dozens of other species of ladybugs. Oh, and that the U.S. is rapidly, apparently, on its way to becoming a monoculture of ladybugs, which is a terrible thing. And what do they eat? Uh, Scale. The, yeah, yeah. Any, any little harmful insects. Right. So it, it doesn't seem too bad initially, but instead of having something like 15 or 20 or 40 species of ladybugs uh -huh. that were gradually shifting the U.S. to be dominated by this one, uh, which oh, wasn't yeah. originally, I think, a native species, actually. So you can just order a box of yes, ladybugs? Yes, but they're all, they always <laughs> apparently send out one particular species, and, yeah, and yeah. that's, yeah. so again, again, that's it's interesting. It's, someone in Wisconsin, I was just in Wisconsin, and someone said, oh, the ladybugs are a terrible problem in the summer, and they, you know, they're everywhere, and they stink which I, I, huh. I had never heard of before, but I thought, why would there be ladybugs? I, I didn't realize that. I, I, I recall one point I was in a, a, a hiking in the Appalachians at a point, place called High Point, at the end of a ridge, sitting there in the grass enjoying a, a rest after a long hike, and then looking and saying, oh, look, there's, cute, there's a ladybug or two yeah. here. And, oh, there's a couple more of them. And then realizing, as so we began looking in the grass around us, it was all ladybugs. I mean, you would move any yeah. chunk of grass, and there were hundreds and thousands of ladybugs. And we realized in this area we were sitting there were probably millions of ladybugs. So it was a little a little unnerving. Yeah, that is. I didn't notice them sticking, but uh, the, the, cause right. the mountain breezes and all, but yeah. Uh, well, it's interesting uh, how we've changed the changed the ecosystem of just about every place on Earth. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, there's a new book called The Sixth Extinction. Uh -huh. And we, we are at the... Yeah. Asteroid. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're, uh, we're the ones. What, the, the Anthropocene epoch now. Yeah, that we're in. exactly. And uh, 
yeah, we're heading toward another Pangea where it, everything's yeah, all yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing. mixed up. We're, we're going to continue this discussion when we come back, but right now we're going to take a brief break. You're here on Lakeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Susan Scott, biologist, adventure author, is uh, with me in the studio, and we're talking about boats, biology, books, all kinds of stuff. Please come back after the break. Here's the deal. Um, I'm Jay Fidel. I'm the host of uh, Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy, which is the Energy Policy Forum's program on Wednesday. That's how we call Wednesday Energy Wednesday. We call it Energy Wednesday every Wednesday. <laughs> Are you surprised? Okay, and we, and we try to we get guys like Jim Alberts here from Hawaiian Electric who can tell us what's really going on in energy. We want to be informed. It's so important. It's the most important initiative in our state. <laughs> Clean energy is major, okay? And that's why we cover it on this show. That's the deal. What do you think, Sharon? I think that's great. That's why we're here every Wednesday from 4 to 5, and we hope you all join us so we can hear people like Jim coming on our show and co-host Ray Starley from Hawaii Energy. Okay, Jim, you've been here today. You've seen this. You heard what she said. What do you think? I think it's a tremendous opportunity for people to come together and talk about the issues. Oftentimes, there isn't a good forum to bring these key issues out into the public, and this is a tremendous way to go about it. And the, the activity of this show is essential to keep talking about energy because, as you said, it's such an essential part of our lives that we need to pay attention to it and we need to think about the future. Okay, Ray, your turn. Well, this is a special time in the history of Hawaii where we're making some pretty radical changes in the way we uh, use energy and generate energy. And this show is the one place you can count on coming to every Wednesday and hearing something about the latest issues that are on the table being discussed that will affect us all going forward. So. Uh, come join us, and if you have some ideas you want to share with us about energy, uh, give us a call and let us know. We'll, we'll put you up here and, uh, and let you talk for an hour. So uh, come see us. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks, Jim. It's great to be, from Think Tank's point of view, it's great to have this show. We love the show. It's our, it's our most important <laughs> show. So come around and listen to us 4 to 5 on Wednesday. Thanks a lot. Bye. Aloha. Aloha. And you're back on Lakeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. With me today in the Think Tech Studios is Susan Scott. We've been talking about her book, Call Me Captain, where she talks about biology, she talks about boats, she talks about her life, all interwoven in a, in a charming and intriguing fashion. And we've been talking about her work at Palmyra Atoll that, that she describes in the book. We talked a little bit about some, some of how she'd gotten to where she is. But uh, one of the things I realized at the start of the show, I, I haven't really introduced her properly. She, she's actually written six books. This is her seventh Seven, book, yeah. right? Six other books, as well uh -huh. as, of course, doing a, a weekly column for, you said, 20 years, 28 years, something like that. You've, uh, you're a volunteer lecturer. You run medical clinics in Bangladesh. Uh, you're a registered nurse. Um, so you, you've done all kinds of volunteer bird counting and, and other wildlife work for the Fish and Wildlife Service. So uh, uh, these other books, what, what's, what's the story? Well, uh, the other books that I've written are, are, are all based on nature in Hawaii. Okay. And one of the interesting things about Hawaii is we, too, have species of plants and animals from all over the world. Sure. So what, uh, if you get bitten by a centipede, well, what, where is that from? Is that a dangerous centipede or is it, is it a benign centipede? So. Okay. Uh, and the same thing in the ocean, you know, people talk about stonefish and step-and-a-half fish, they call them in Australia, because you die in a step-and-a-half, which is a myth. <laughs> but uh, my, my husband was really interested in, in the myth versus science in uh, emergency medicine, because he mm -hmm. would get people who came into the emergency room who urinated on their uh, jellyfish stings right. and, and done all kinds of strange things. Right. And, said, well, let's put some science to this. Let, let's do some evidence-based uh, information about the ocean. So we wrote a book together called All Stings Considered. Uh -huh. And uh, <laughs> Very cute. Yeah, we, we had a really good time uh, looking for the science behind the treatments, the medical treatments of uh, uh, vana, you know, sea urchin, spines, and foot. And so that, that was a, a really interesting, good experience at the University of Hawaii Press published. And then people started asking both of us about plants, poisonous plants, and, and spiders 
bites, and so he said, well, we got to have to write another book. So we, we, I wrote one uh, with Craig about um, plant, the other plants and animals of the islands on the, uh, on the land, and it got so big that we ended up dividing it into plant, one book, plants called uh, Poisonous Plants in Paradise, and the other is, is uh, I don't know, Poisonous Animals. So we have three medical books that we co-authored uh, with Craig, and those have been pretty popular, and they were really interesting. It makes me walk around Hawaii looking at things very differently. Uh, I think, you know, you never know what's going to come in, what spiders and other things are coming in, but I think the state is doing a pretty good job of trying to keep, uh, keep things out. So, so those books were, um, were really interesting to, to write and educational for us, mm -hmm. and also we wrote them, I wrote them in the way that I write everything, so people can understand it. And Craig said, well, doctor, doctors are using these books in the emergency rooms and in their family practices, but he said, doctors don't want to write, read, you know, five paragraphs of big words either. <laughs> we just want to know, right. get to the, the, the meat of it. So, sure. So those were those are written for for parents also and people who can, you know, just want to know what's happening, what kind of plants to plant in their yard. Mm -hmm. They have little kids, and, and so we have a first aid for them, and then advanced medical for uh, physicians. But as Craig said, they're hard to keep in the ERs because people take them. <laughs> they like them, so oh, they take well, them. That's great. That's but, great. Um, yes, and then the other books that uh, I'm working right now with uh, Wally Johnson, who's the a lifetime researcher of our colea. The uh, Pacific, Golden Pacific Plover. Uh -huh. So uh, we're just talking about putting a book together because every time I write a column about the the, the Kalea, which is the Hawaiian name for them, I, I get dozens of dozens of letters about people telling me about the ones that they have in their yard and where do they go and what do they do. And someone told me recently I saw, I saw Kalea chicks. Well, they don't have chicks in Hawaii. They only have them in Alaska. These are migratory uh -huh. shorebirds, okay. and so. Uh, I know from my letters that we, we need a book, <laughs> so we really need a book. And Wally uh, really needs, wants to write one too. Uh, he's been researching them all his life and keeping me up to date with his papers. Mm -hmm. And so he sends me the papers and I write the columns. So I think we're in we're pretty good uh, shape to put a book together for the lay public, oh. for, for everybody. You know, it's the same sure. thing as the medical books. Sure. Oh, you know, yeah. science people don't want to, you know, we want to know, we want to know what we want to know, or look it up. Right, but it's, so. it's important to get that information out there. Uh, yeah. the, the sea urchins you mentioned, right. I mean, they are very dangerous. Yeah. My, my wife, on her first visit here, landed on one and got some spines. And uh -huh. uh, a few weeks later, her fingers were just curling inward. Yeah. I mean, and, yeah. and they had to go in and do surgery right. on her hand to yeah. clear them out. And yeah. that's, that's no fun. Right, and you don't know how dangerous they are. Right. Because there's, there's different. Now, our scorpion fish are a different family than the Australian stonefish. Uh -huh. And so they hurt like crazy. But you want to know that they're not going to kill you. No one's ever died from them. Oh, well. you, you might feel like you want to die. <laughs> I think they're pretty painful. I've not been stunned. But uh, yeah, so so that that is really good to know. Yeah, no, it's it's great to have. And, and yes, as you say, it, it's peculiar because it, it brings the whole question about about what is sort of natural here in Hawaii. Right. And <clears throat> do you count that as pre-human contact, yeah. which is really the only sort of true right. na nature? Right. Uh, or do you kind of from early Polynesian settlement, exactly. uh, which brought in dozens and dozens of different life right. forms, right. but they've been around now for thousands of years at least, and have sort of worked out a balance. Yeah, yeah. yeah and then yes, there's been successive waves of, of immigration of different uh, species, uh, and uh, yeah, the the, the fish and uh, not the fish and wildlife, but the the folks who uh, agriculture and all watches very closely uh, to be sure that we don't bring in. Right. things we don't want here because they understand it. it's yeah. very easy on islands to get a, a disruptive force involved and, and the discouraging thing is people smuggle them in yes. so you see people in the newspaper you know, say someone found a boa constrictor yes. or something. you think well i don't know right. but that that's the problem i think of of the the whole pangea thing is we're not we're one species as humans but we're definitely not a united front right you know right. to 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 do one thing is, is really difficult because people have different ideas. Right, so. and, yeah, and you, people do. They want to bring in their, their favorite animal right. and uh, release it and have it right. have it thrive. Yeah. And, and in a sense, of course, we can you can look at this as we are, we're doing sort of an engineering experiment on a big scale with very bad controls. Uh, 
but we're just essentially we're continuing to modify ecosystems at a very rapid rate now and, and sort of helping to create new non-natural ecosystems. But they're still ecosystems. And are, <coughs> and are we part? We are we part of that evolution? Right. Yeah. What? Yeah. Well, big, we're, we're big certain, philosophical right, right. idea. Can, since we can control it, are are we really a part of it? Yeah. We certainly are. Right. Yeah. We're, we're but, deep, yeah. deeply enmeshed in it, certainly, right. and uh, uh, very caught up in, in the cycle of it. Uh, so. Yeah. <laughs> but um, no, pe people complain about uh, Hawaii is very tough to bring your dog or your cat into, and, uh, and certainly we brought two cockatoos here from Seattle, and yes, uh -huh. they had to go through two Are different quarantine quarantined? procedures, and basically uh -huh. uh, through cl plant quarantine people, which I at first was very puzzled by. Yeah. It's just the way they work things out here, mm -hmm. and, and I, I totally do applaud the, the authorities for really trying to keep and doing a very good job, I think, right. keeping a lot of stuff out because. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you, you, yeah, it is. There's so much stuff coming and going from every corner of the, the world here. Well, I, I wrote a column recently. Saw a reader sent me a picture of an upside-down jellyfish. They're called Cassiopeia, and they they, they lay with the bell down, huh. and they and I re didn't realize because I've seen them. They're not native here. Huh. Some they were probably brought here and shipped ballast huh. or whatever. You know, who knows? But the, there's a lot of marine species that aren't native mm -hmm. here too. Not some. You don't huh. know which. What's all out there? Yeah. So people say, "Oh, I saw a sea snake," uh, which we don't supposedly have any sea snakes. Uh -huh. But I would say, I never say, "No, you didn't." Right. I say, "Send me a picture right. that I've not, I've only seen pictures of more eels so uh -huh. far right. from visitors who think they see snakes." But you know, it certainly could happen. Sure. And, um, you know, don't want to say, "No, you didn't see that." Right, but but you you, you don't want to let these things get out of control. It's much right. uh, exactly. uh, much easier to stop it with one or two of them around. Yeah. Uh, it was at the picture in the paper the other day of a, uh, not the other day, a month or so ago of a good-sized coconut crab somewhere oh, right. in Pearl City, yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah, walking down the yeah, street. Yeah, walking down the street. <laughs> yeah. And like, okay, this looks like a serious, you probably they don't want a bunch of those yeah. animals uh, wandering around. Right. They, they certainly cause a certain amount of havoc. I think it's doing fine at the zoo. I haven't heard in a while, <laughs> so. But it, it's interesting because people haven't seen them. There's, right. there's so much myth about coconut crabs. That, right. They do all these things, but it, it'd be fun if, if they exhibit it. I don't, I don't yeah. know if they're going to. Yeah, but like, like most well, islands, it's a very open ecosystem right. here, and there's lo lots of niches that are not right. filled, and so it's very easy for right. invaders to, to come in, establish themselves, yeah. make themselves right at home. And, and in the old days, it, that was uh, in, an interesting experiment to bring something here and see how it, if it sure. thrived. And, and in a sense, it was sort of an impoverished. Uh, right. Ecosystem right. because it had really been settled by so few things being so right. isolated, and so it, well, the early yeah. stuff was just really sort of enrichment in some sense. You could do it. And of course, I'm sure some of the early native species got squashed right out. Right, right. Uh, so it's, yeah. it's it's all it's all back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great. It's it's wonder wonderful to to think about all these these good good issues and uh, the issue of the invasive species in the marine environment too. I hadn't mm -hmm. really thought so much about that, but for yeah, a whole right. a whole new thing to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. But you know, <clears throat> but it's been it's been so uh, enjoyable and informative uh, talking with you here and learning so much, uh, and I always enjoy your columns uh, when I read them. I yeah. certainly enjoyed your book here, and I thank you very much for taking the time from from your schedule to come on and talk to me. Uh, I've been talking with Susan Scott. Her book, Call Me Captain, details her adventures <clears throat> and sailing down to Palmyra Atoll, the work there, her life. She's an uh, <coughs> accomplished author. Of, this is just her seventh book, and I guess eighth is in, in progress now. So uh, she does a weekly column in the Star Advertiser. You can find that, and a very enjoyable column, too. So uh, thank you again. Thank you. And aloha.